Hello, everyone. Welcome to Storytime with Moog. I am Moog, and today we are continuing on with The Man Who Laughs by Victor Hugo. And today we are starting with part two, book the first, chapter five. I had to look at that like right before coming on just to make sure that that's where we were. But first, okay, let's let's get all of our giggles out now because we know that this isn't a romp. So today we are in part two, part two, book the first, chapter five. Um, okay, so what happened last time? Let me think. We, the time before that, we had Ursus who, they went to Ursus's, like, van, and Ursus was taking care of them. And then last time, we started part two. But it's all been more political stuff. It's been relationships between the different people involved in the aristocracy, as well as the change between the two kings. And... Oh, man, what else? Um, one of the kings was, like, super, super sick and, like, excommunicated, but, like, a self-excommunication and went off to somewhere, the Netherlands, maybe... Um, had a kid, it was rumored, but nobody has seen this kid, um, and the king that was in charge sort of made somebody else take over, like, what this ex can be, I'm terrible with names, sorry, that's why nobody is being named right now, but it's supposed to be taking over the, like, responsibilities that the excommunicated person had. And I'm sure that it's because the king doesn't want the heir, if there is an heir, to come in and rule so that the king can have, like, little, you know, fingers and pies. Is that a saying? Or is that just me putting my fingers in desserts? <laughs> um, but I think... I think that's all that's happening is just the is just the uh political aspects that's happening. <laughs> all right. Chapter 5. Queen Anne. 1. Above this couple there was Anne, Queen of England. An ordinary woman was Queen Anne. She was happy, kindly, august to a certain extent. No quality of hers attained a virtue, none to vice. Her stoutness was bloated, her fun heavy, her good nature stupid. She was stubborn and weak. As a wife, she was faithless and faithful, having favorites to whom she gave up her heart, and a husband for whom she kept her bed. As a Christian, she was a heretic and a bigot. She had one beauty, the well-developed neck of a Naobi. The rest of her person was indifferently formed. She was a clumsy coquette and a chaste one. Her skin was white and fine. She displayed a great deal of it. It was she who introduced the fashion of necklaces to the large pearls clasped round her throat. She had a narrow forehead, sensual lips, fleshy cheeks, large eyes, short sight. Her short sight extended to her mind. Beyond a burst of merriment now and then, almost as ponderous as her anger, she lived in a sort of taciturn grumble and a grumbling silence. Words escaped from her which had to be guessed at. She was a mixture of a good woman and a mischievous devil. She liked surprises, which is extremely womanlike. Anne was a pattern, just sketched roughly, of the universal Eve. To that sketch had fallen that chance, the throne. She drank. Her husband was a Dane, thoroughbred. A Tory, she governed by the Whigs, like a woman, like a mad woman. She had fits of rage. She was violent, a brawler. Nobody more awkward than Anne in directing affairs of state. She allowed events to fall about as they might chance. Her whole policy was cracked. She excelled in bringing about great catastrophes from little causes. 
When a whim of authority took hold of her, she called it giving a stir with the poker. She would say with an air of profound thought, No peer may keep his hat on before the king except de Courcy, Baron Kingsale, an Irish peer. Or, It would be an injustice were my husband not to be Lord High Admiral, since my father was. And she made George of Denmark High Admiral of England and of all Her Majesty's plantations. She was perpetually perspiring bad humor. She did not explain her thought. She exuded it. There was something of the sphinx in this goose. She rather liked fun, teasing, and practical jokes. Could she have made Apollo a hunchback? It would have delighted her. But she would have left him a god. Good-natured, her ideal was to allow none to despair and to worry all. She had often a rough word in her mouth. A little more, and she would have sworn like Elizabeth. From time to time she would take from a man's pocket, which she wore in her skirt, a little round box of chased silver, on which was her portrait in profile, between the two letters Q, A. She would open this box and take from it, on her finger, a little pomade, with which she reddened her lips, and, having colored her mouth, would laugh. She was greedily fond of that fl of the flat Zealand gingerbread cakes. She was proud of being fat. More of a Puritan than anything else, she would, nevertheless, have liked to devote herself to stage plays. She had an absurd academy of music, copied after that of France. In 1700, a Frenchman named Fortroche, that's probably not how, what his name was, wanted to build a royal circus at Paris at a cost of 400,000 francs, which scheme was opposed by Dargenson. This Fortoche passed into England and proposed to Queen Anne, who was immediately charmed by the idea, to build in London a theatre with machinery, with a fourth understage finer than that of the King of France. Like Louis the Fourteenth, she liked to be driven at a gallop. Her teams and relays would sometimes do the distance between London and Windsor in less than an hour and a quarter. Two. In Anne's time, no meeting was allowed without the permission of two justices of the peace. The assembly of twelve persons, were it only to eat oysters and drink porter, was a felony. Interesting. Under her reign, otherwise relatively mild, pressing for the fleet was carried on with extreme violence, a gloomy evidence that the Englishman is a subject rather than a citizen. For centuries, England suffered under that process of tyranny which gave the lie to all the old charters of freedom, and out of which France especially gathered a cause of triumph and indignation. What in some degree diminishes the triumph is that while sailors were pressed in England, soldiers were pressed in France. In every great town of France, any able-bodied man going through the streets on his business, was liable to be shoved by the crimps into a house called the oven. There was, there he was shut up with others in the same plight. Those fit for service were picked out, and the recruiters sold them to the officers. In 1695, there were 30 of these ovens in Paris. The laws against Ireland, emanating from Queen Anne, were atrocious. Anne was born in 1664, two years before the Great Fire of London, on which the astrologers, there were some left, and Louis the Fourteenth was born with the assistance of an astrologer and swaddled in a horoscope, predicted that, being the elder sister of fire, she would be queen. And so she was, thanks to astrology and the revolution of 1688. She had the humiliation of having only Gilbert, Archbishop of Canterbury, for godfather. To be godchild of the Pope was no longer possible in England. A mere primate is but a poor sort of godfather. Anne had to put up with one, however. It was her own fault. Why was she a Protestant? 
Denmark had paid for her virginity. Virginitas emptas, as the old charters expressed it, were a dowry of 6,250 pounds a year, secured on the bailiwick of Wardenburg and the island of Samarn. And followed, without conviction and by routine, the traditions of William. The English, under that royalty born of a revolution, possessed as much liberty as they could lay hands on between the Tower of London, into which they put orators, and the pillory, into which they put writers. Anne spoke a little Danish in her private chats with her husband, and a little French in her private chats with Bolingbroke. Wretched gibberish, but the height of English fashion, especially at court, was to talk French. There was never a bon mot but in French. Anne paid a deal of attention to her coins, especially to copper coins, which are the low and popular ones. She wanted to cut a great figure on them. Six farthings were struck during her reign. On the back of the first three, she had merely a throne struck. On the back of the fourth, she ordered a triumphal chariot. And on the back of the sixth, a goddess holding a sword in one hand and an olive branch in the other, with the scroll, Beo Epes. Her father, James the Second, was candid and cruel. She was brutal. At the same time, she was mild at bottom, a contradiction which only appears such. A fit of anger metamorphosed her. Heat sugar, and it will boil. Anne was popular. England liked feminine rulers. Why? France exudes them. There is a reason at once. Perhaps there is no other. With English historians Elizabeth embodies grandeur, and good nature, as they will, be it so. But there is nothing delicate in the reigns of these women. The lines are heavy. It is gross grandeur and gross good nature. As to their immaculate virtue, England is tenacious of it, and we are not going to oppose the idea. Elizabeth was a virgin tempered by Essex, Anne a wife complicated by Bolingbroke. 3. One idiotic habit of the people is to attribute to the king what they do themselves. They fight. Who's the glory? The king's. They pay. Who's the generosity? The king's. Then the people love him for being so rich. The king receives a crown from the poor and returns them a farthing. How generous he is. The colossus which is the pedestal contemplates the pygmy which is the statue. How great is this myrmidon. He is on my back. A dwarf has an excellent way of being taller than a giant. It is to perch himself on his shoulders. But that the giant should allow it. There is the wonder, and that he should admire the height of the dwarf. There is the folly. Simplicity of mankind. The question, the equestrian statue, reserved for kings alone, is an excellent figure of royalty. The horse is the people. Only that the horse becomes transfigured by degrees. It begins in an ass. It ends in a lion. Then it throws its rider, and you have 1642 in England and 1789 in France. And sometimes it devours him. And you have in England 1649 and in France 1793. That the lion should relapse into the donkey is astonishing, but it is so. This was occurring in England. It had resumed the paddle sack, the pack saddle, idolatry of the crown. Queen Anne, as we have just observed, was popular. What was she doing to be so? Nothing. Nothing. That is all that is asked of the sovereign of England. He receives for that nothing one million two hundred fifty thousand pounds a year. In 1705, England, which had had but thirteen men of war under Elizabeth and thirty-six under James I, counted a hundred and fifty in her feet in her fleet. The English had three armies, five thousand men in Catalonia, 
10,000 in Portugal, 50,000 in Flanders, and besides, was paying 1,666,666 pounds a year to monarchical and diplomatic Europe, a sort of prostitute the English people has always had in keeping. Parliament, having voted a patriotic loan for 34 million francs of annuities, there had been a crush at the exchequer to subscribe it. England was sending a squadron to the East Indies and a squadron to the west of Spain under Admiral Lee, without mentioning the reserve of 400 sail under Admiral Sir Cloudsley Shovel. England had lately annexed Scotland. It was the interval between Hochstadt and Remillies. And the first of these victories was foretelling the second. England, in its cast of the net at Hochstadt, had made prisoners of 27 battalions and four regiments of dragoons, and deprived France of 100 leagues of country. France drawing back dismayed from the Danube to the Rhine. England was stretching her hand out towards Sardinia and the Balearic Islands. She was bringing into her ports in triumph ten Spanish line of battleships and many a galleon laden with gold. Hudson Bay and Straits were already half given over by Louis the Fourteenth. It felt that he was about to give up his hold over Acadia. St. Christopher, and Newfoundland, and that he would be but too happy if England would only tolerate the King of France fishing for cod at Cape Breton. England was about to impose upon him the shame of demolishing himself the fortifications of Dunkirk. Meanwhile, she had taken Gibraltar and was taking Barcelona. What great things accomplished! How was it possible to refuse an admiration for taking the trouble of living at the period. From a certain point of view, the reign of Anne appears a reflection of the reign of Louis XIV. Anne, for a moment, even with that king in the race which is called history, bears to him the vague resemblance of a reflection. Like him, she plays a great reign. She has her moments, her monuments, her arts, her victories, her captains, her men of letters her privy purse to pension celebrities, her gallery of chefs d'oeuvre, side by side with those of his majesty. Her court, too, was a cortege, with the features of a triumph, an order, and a march. It was a miniature copy of all the great men of Versailles, not giants themselves. In it there is enough to deceive the eye, add God, save the queen." which might have been taken from Lily, and the ensemble becomes an illusion, not a personage is missing. Christopher Wren is a very passable mansard. Somars is as good as La Mignon. Anne has a Racine in Dryden, a Boileau in Pope, a Colbert in Godolphin, a Louveau in Pembroke, and a Turin in Marlborough. Tighten the wigs and lower the foreheads. The whole is solemn and pompous, and the Windsor of the time has a faded resemblance to Marley. Still, the whole was effeminate, and Anne Per, Anne's Per Tellier, was called Sarah Jennings. However, there is an outline of incipient irony, which fifty years later was to turn to philosophy, in the literature of the age, and the Protestant Tartuffe is unmasked by Swift just in the same way as the Catholic Tartuffe is denounced by Moliere. Although the England of the period quarrels and fights France, she imitates her and draws enlightenment from her, and the light on the façade of England is French light. It is a pity that Anne's reign lasted but twelve years, or the English would not hesitate to call it the century of Anne, as we say, the century of Louis the Fourteenth. Anne disappeared in 1702, as Louis the Fourteenth declined. It is one of the curiosities of history that the rise of that pale planet coincides with the setting of the planet of purple, 
and that at the moment in which France had the, had the king sun, England should have had the queen moon. A detail to be noted. Louis the Fourteenth, although they had made war with him, was greatly admired in England. He is the kind of king they want in France, said the English. They love... The love of the English for their own liberty is mingled with a certain acceptance of servitude for others. That favorable regard of the chains which bind their neighbors sometimes attains to enthusiasm for the deep despo next door. To sum up, Anne rendered her people hero as the French translator of Beverell's book repeats three times with graceful reiteration at the sixth and ninth page of his dedication and the third of his preface okay so they don't do anything <laughs> the aristocracy don't do anything and they profit from war and what they give back is very very little and they get like an like a yearly like payment of millions hundreds of thousands for not doing anything and people love them just just summon that part up <laughs> part four queen anne bore a little grudge to the duchess hosiana for two reasons firstly because she thought the Duchess Hosiana handsome. Secondly, because she thought the Duchess Hosiana's betrothed handsome. Two reasons for jealousy are sufficient for a woman. One is sufficient for a queen. Let us add that she bore her a grudge for being her sister. Anne did not like women to be pretty. She considered it against good morals. As for herself, she was ugly. Not from choice, however. A part of her religion she derived from that ugliness. Hosiana, beautiful and philosophical, was a cause of vexation to the queen. To an ugly queen, a pretty duchess is not an agreeable sister. There was another grievance, Hosiana's improper birth. Anne was the daughter of Anne Hyde, a simple gentlewoman, legitimately, but this vexatiously, married by James the Second, when Duke of York. Anne, having this inferior blood in her veins, felt herself but half royal, and Hosiana, having come into the world quite irregularly, drew closer attention to the incorrectness, less great, but really existing in the birth of the queen. The daughter of Messiaens, looked without love upon the daughter of bastardy so near her it was an unpleasant resemblance hosiana had a right to say to anne my mother was at least as good as yours at court no one said so but they evidently thought it this was a bore for her royal majesty why this hosiana what had put it into her head to be born what good was a Hosiana? Certain relationships are detrimental. Nevertheless, Anne smiled on Hosiana. Perhaps she might even have liked her had she not been her sister. Okay. End of chapter five. So that was Queen, good old Queen Anne's chapter. And what have we learned? She does not like Hosiana because she's pretty because she's her sister, all of these other things, because she sort of also has, like, not royal blood on both sides, like an improper birth. Um, and, yeah, Anne is not great. <laughs> and we also get a breakdown, of course, about how many properties she has and, like, all of the different places that she, like, rules over and all of the money that she gets and for some reason people really like her for some reason and of course the next person has a name that is complicated 
Chapter 6. Barkelphedro. 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 Got it. Chapter 6. Barkelphedro. It is useful to know what people do, and a certain surveillance is wise. Hosiana had Lord David watched by a little creature of hers, in whom she reposed confidence, and whose name was Barkelphedro. Lord David had Hosiana discreetly observed by a creature of his, of whom he was sure, and whose name was Barkelphedro. Queen Anne, on her part, kept herself secretly informed of the actions and conduct of the Duchess Hosiana, her bastard sister, and of Lord David, her future brother-in-law, by the left hand, by a creature of hers, on whom she counted fully, and whose name was... Barkelphedro. This Barkelphedro had his fingers on that keyboard. Luciana, Lord David, a queen. A man between two women. What modulations possible? What amalgamation of souls? Barkelphedro had not always held the magnificent position of whispering into three ears. He was an old servant of the Duke of York. He had tried to be a churchman, but had failed. The Duke of York, an English and a Roman prince, compounded of royal popery and legal angelicanism, and his Catholic house and his Protestant house, and might have pushed Barkelphedro in one or the other hierarchy, but he did not judge him to be Catholic enough to make him almoner, or Protestant enough to make him chaplain. So that between two religions, Barkelphedro found himself with his soul on the ground. Not a bad posture, either, for certain reptile souls. Certain ways are impracticable, except by crawling flat on the belly. An obscure but fattening servitude had long made up Barkelphedro's whole existence. Service is something, but he wanted power besides. He was, perhaps, about to reach it when James the Second fell. He had to begin all over again. Nothing to do under William the Third, a sullen prince, and exercising in his mode of reigning a prudery which he believed to be probity. Barkelphedro, when his protector, James the Second, was dethroned, did not lapse all at once into rags. There was, there is a something which survives deposed princes, and which feeds and sustains their parasites. The remains of the exhaustible sap causes leaves to live on for two or three days on the branches of the uprooted tree. Then, all at once, the leaf yellows and dries up, and thus it is with the courtier. Thanks to that embalming, which is called legitimacy, the prince himself, although fallen and cast away, lasts and keeps preserved. It is not so with the courtier, which much more dead than the king. The king, beyond there, is a mummy. The courtier, here, is a phantom. To be the shadow of a shadow is leanness indeed. Hence, Barkelphedro became famished. Then he took up the character of a man of letters. But he was thrust back even from the kitchens. Sometimes he knew not where to sleep. Who will give me shelter? He would ask. He struggled on. All that is interesting in patience in distress he possessed. He had, besides, the talent of the termite, knowing how to bore a hole from the bottom to the top, by dint of making use of the name of James the Second, of old memories, of fables of fidelity, of touching stories, he pierced as far as the Duchess Hosiana's heart. Hosiana took a liking to this man of poverty and wit, an interesting combination. She presented him to Lord Deary Moore, gave him a shelter in the servants' hall among her domestics, retained him in her house, was kind to him, and sometimes even spoke to him. Barkelphedral, 
Markle Pedro felt neither hunger nor cold again. Hosiana addressed him in the second person. It was the fashion for great ladies to do so to men of letters who allowed it. The Marquise de Maile received Roy, whom she had never seen before in bed, and said to him, C'est toi qui es fait, l'âne galant, bonjour. Later on, the men of letters returned to the custom. The day came when Fabre Le Delegant said to the Duchess de Rohan, N'est tu pas le chabon? For Barcalfedro to be vied and vowed was a success. He was overjoyed by it. He had aspired to this contemptuous familiarity. Lady Hosiana vies and vows me, he would say to himself and he would rub his hands. He profited by this veeing and vowing to make further way. He became a sort of constant attendant in Hosiana's private rooms, in no way troublesome, unperceived. The Duchess would almost have changed her shift before him. All this, however, was precarious. Barcalfedro was aiming at a position. A Duchess was halfway, an underground passage which did not lead to the queen was having bored for nothing. One day, Barcalfedro said to Hosiana, Would your grace like to make my fortune? What dost thou want? An appointment. An appointment? For thee? Yes, madam. What an idea! Thou to ask for an appointment, thou who art good for nothing. That's just the reason. Hosiana burst out laughing. Among the offices to which thou art unsuited, which dost thou desire? That of cork-drawer of the bottles of the ocean. Hosiana's laugh redoubled. What meanest thou? Thou art fooling. No, madam. To amuse myself, I shall answer you seriously, said the Duchess. What dost thou wish to be? Repeat it uncorker of the bottles of the ocean. Everything is possible at court. Is there an appointment of that kind? Yes, madam. This is news to me. Go on. There is such an appointment. Swear it on the soul which thou dost not possess. I swear it. I do not believe thee. Thank you, madam. When thou wishest, begin again to uncork the bottles of the ocean. That is a situation which can give little trouble. It is like grooming a bronze horse. Very nearly. Nothing to do. Well, tis a situation to suit thee. Thou art good for that much. You see, I am good for something. Come, thou art making, thou art talking nonsense. Is there such an appointment? Barcalfredro assumed an attitude of deferential gravity. Madam, you had an august father, James the Second, the king, and you have an illustrious brother-in-law, George of Denmark, Duke of Cumberland. Your father was, and your brother is, Lord High Admiral of England. Is what thou tellest me fresh news? I know all that as well as thou. But here is what your grace does not know. In the sea there are three kinds of things, those at the bottom, Lagan, those which float, Flotsam. Those which the sea throws up the shore. Jetsam. And then, these three things, Wagen, Flotsam, and Jetsam, become to the High Lord Admiral, belong to the High Lord Admiral. And then, your grace understands. No. All that is in the sea, all that sinks, all that floats, all that is cast ashore, all belongs to the Admiral of England. Really? Everything? And then? Except the sturgeon, which belongs to the king. I should have thought, said Hosiana, all that would have belonged to Neptune. Neptune is a fool. He has given up everything. He has allowed the English to take everything. Finished what thou wert saying. Prizes of the sea is the name given to such treasure trove. Be it so. It is boundless. There is always something floating, something being cast up. It is the contribution of the sea, 
the tax which the ocean pays to England. With all my heart, but pray conclude. Your grace understands that in this way the ocean creates a department. Where? At the Admiralty. What department? The Sea Prize Department. Well, the department is subdivided into three offices, Lagan, Flotsam, and Jetsam, and in each there is an officer. And then, a ship at sea writes to give notice on any subject to those on land that is sailing in such a latitude, that has met a sea monster, that is in sight of shore, that is in distress, that is about to founder, and it is lost, etc. The captain takes a bottle, puts it in a bit of paper, on which he has written the information, corks up the flask, and casts it into the sea. If the bottle goes to the bottom, it is in the department of the Lagan officer. If it floats, it is in the department of the Flotsam officer. If it is thrown upon shore, it contains, it concerns the Jetsam officer. And wouldst thou like to be the Jetsam officer? Precisely so. And what is, and that is what thou callest uncorking the bottles of the ocean? Since there is such an appointment. Why dost thou wish for the last named place in preference to both of the others? Because it is vacant just now. In what does the appointment consist? Madam, in 1598, a tarred bottle picked up by a man conger fishing on the strand of Epidium Promitorium was brought to Queen Elizabeth, and a parchment drawn out of it gave information to England that Holland had taken, without saying anything about it, in unknown country, Nova Zembla, that the capture had taken place in June 1596, that in that country people were eaten by bears, and that the manner of passing the winter was described on a paper enclosed in a musket casing hanging in the chimney of the wooden house built in the island, and left by the Dutchmen, who were all dead, and that the chimney was built of a barrel, with the end knocked out, sunk into the roof. I don't understand much of thy rigmarole. Be it so, Elizabeth understood. A country the more of for Holland was a country the less for England. The bottle which had given the information was held to be of importance, and thenceforward an order was issued that anybody who should find a sealed bottle on the seashore should take it to the Lord High Admiral of England, under the pain of the gallows. The Admiral entrusts the opening of such bottles to an officer, who presents the contents to the Queen, if there be reason for doing so. Are many such bottles brought to the Admiralty? But few. But it's all the same. The appointment exists. There is for the office a room and lodgings at the Admiralty. And for that way of doing nothing, how is one paid? One hundred guineas a year. And thou wouldst trouble me for that much? It is enough to live upon. Like a beggar? As it becomes one of my sort. One hundred guineas. What keeps you for a minute keeps us for a year. That's the advantage of the poor. Thou shalt have the place. A week afterwards, thanks to Hosianna's exertions, thanks to the influence of Lord David Deary Muir, Barclfadral, safe thenceforward, drawn out of his precarious existence, lodged and boarded with a salary of a hundred guineas was installed at the Admiralty. End of chapter six. All right, so we have a new character, Barkle Phaedro, and he is being paid by Lord David to look after Hosiana, by Hosiana to look after Lord David, and by the Queen to keep eyes on both of them. And we sort of get like his past, like he was with the previous king, and, or I think he was with. He worked under King uh, James the Second, I think. And then, you know, it switched over and there was no need for him, blah, blah, blah. So he tried to go into 
uh, priesthood and it just didn't work out in a variety of different sects. And then he just sort of stumbles upon Hosiana and asks for this specific position, a specific appointment because it is free and he wants to be the jetsam person to uncork bottles that have been found on land. And everything's fine. <laughs> All right. Chapter seven. Barkle Phaedro gnaws his way. Ooh. There is one thing the most pressing of all, to be ungrateful. Barkle Phaedro was not wanting therein. Having received so many benefits from Hosiana, he had naturally but one thought, to revenge himself on her. When we add that Hosiana was beautiful, great, young, rich, powerful, illustrious, Bar while Barkle Phaedro was ugly, little, old, poor, dependent, obscure, he must necessarily revenge himself for all this as well. When a man is made out of night, how is he to forgive so many beams of light? Barkle Phaedro was an Irishman who had denied Ireland a bad species. Barkle Phaedro had but one thing in his favor, that he had a very big belly. A big belly passes for a sign of kind-heartedness. But his belly was but in addition to Barkle Phaedro's hypocrisy, for the man was full of malice. What was Barkle Phaedro's age? None. The age necessary for his project of the moment. He was old in his wrinkles and gray hairs, young in the activity of his mind. He was active and ponderous, a sort of hippopotamus monkey. A royalist, certainly. A republican? Who knows? A Catholic, perhaps. A Protestant, without a doubt. For Stuart, probably. For Brunswick, evidently. To be for is a power only on the condition of being at the same time against. Barkle Phaedro practiced this wisdom. The appointment of drawer in the bottles of the ocean was not as absurd as Bar Barkle Phaedro had appeared to make out. The complaints, which would in these times be termed declamations of Garcia Fernandez in his chart book of the sea, against the robbery of jetsam called the right of wreck and against of pillage of wreck of the, by the inhabitants of the coast, had created a sensation in England and had obtained for the shipwrecked this reform, that their goods, chattels, and property, instead of being stolen by the country people, were confiscated by the Lord Hyde, High Admiral. All the debris of the sea cast upon the English shore Merchandise, broken hulls of ships, bales, chests, etc., belonged to the Lord High Admiral. But, and here was revealed the importance of the place asked for by Barkle Phaedro, the floating receptacles containing messages and declarations awakened particularly the attention of the Admiralty. Shipwrecks are one of England's gravest cares. Navigation being her life, shipwreck is her anxiety. England is kept in perpetual care by the sea. The little bottle, the little glass bottle thrown to the waves by the doomed ship contains a final intelligence, precious from every point of view. Intelligence concerning the ship, intelligence concerning the crew, intelligence concerning the place, the time, the manner of loss, intelligence concerning the winds which have broken up the vessel, intelligence concerning the currents which bore the floating flask ashore. The situation filled by Barkle Phaedro has been abolished more than a century, but it had its real utility. The last holder was William Hussey of Doddington in Lincolnshire. The man who held it was a sort of guardian of the things of the sea. All the closed and sealed up, sealed up vessels, bottles, Flasks, jars, thrown upon the English coast by the tide, were brought to him. He alone had the right to open them. 
He was first in the secrets of their contents. He put them in order and ticketed them with his signature. The expression Lober on papier au griff still used in the Channel Islands is thence derived. However, one precaution was certainly taken. Not one of these bottles could be unsealed except in the presence of two jurors of the Admiralty sworn to secrecy, who signed conjointly with the holder of the Jetsam office, the official reporting of the opening. But these jurors, being held to secrecy, there resulted for Bargol Phaedro a certain discretionary latitude. It depended upon him, to a certain extent, to express, to suppress a fact or bring it to light. These fragile floating messages were far from being what Barcalfedro had told Hosiana, rare and insignificant. Sometimes they reached land with little delay, at others, after many years. That depends on the winds and the currents. The fashion of casting bottles on the surface of the sea has somewhat passed away, like that of vowing offerings. But in those religious times, those who were about to die were glad thus to send their last thought to God and to men, and at times these messages from the sea were plentiful at the Admiralty. A parchment preserved in the hall at Audlean, with notes by the Earl of Suffolk, Grand Treasurer of England under James I, bears witness that in the one year, 1615, fifty-two flasks, bladders, and tarred vessels containing mention of sinking ships were brought and registered in the records of the Lord High Admiral. Court appointments are the drop of oil in the widow's cruise. They ever increase. Thus it is that the porter has become chancellor and the groom constable. The special officer charged with the appointment desired and obtained by Barcalfedra was invari invariably a confidential man. Elizabeth had wished that it should be so. At court, to speak of confidence is to speak of intrigue, and to speak of intrigue is to speak of advancement. This functionary had come to be a personage of some consideration. He was a clerk, and ranked directly after the two grooms of the almonry. He had the right of entrance into the palace, but we must add what was called the humble entrance, humulus introitus, and even into the bedchamber, for it was the custom that he should inform the monarch, on occasions of sufficient importance, of the objects found which were often very curious, the wills of men in despair, farewells cast to fatherland, revelations of falsified logs, bills of ladding, and crimes committed at sea, legacies to the crown, etc., that he should maintain his records in communication with the court, and should account from time to time to the king or queen concerning the opening of these ill-omened bottles, it was the black cabinet of the ocean. Elizabeth, who was always glad of an opportunity of speaking Latin, used to ask Tonfield of Coley in Berkshire, jetsam officer of her day, when he brought her one of these papers cast up by the sea. We're speaking a different language. But then in parentheses, there's immediately the translation. So just pretend I'm speaking in amazing different language. And this is what I'm saying. What does Neptune write me? The way had been eaten. The insect had succeeded. Barcalfedro approached the queen. This was all he wanted. To make his fortune? No. To unmake that of others? A greater happiness. To hurt is to enjoy. To have within one the desire of injuring, vague but implacable, and never to lose sight of it, is not given to all. Barcalfedro possessed that fixity of intention. As the bulldog holds on with its jaws, so did his thoughts. To feel himself inexorable gave him a depth of gloomy satisfaction, as long as he had a prey 
under his teeth or in his soul a certainty of devil do of evil doing he wanted nothing he was happy shivering in the cold with his neighbor was suffering to be malignant is an opulence such a man is believed to be poor and in truth is so but he has all the riches and malice and prefers having them so everything is in what contents contents one contents one contents one to do a bad turn which is the same as a good turn is better than money bad for him who endures good for him who does it catesby the colleague of guy fox in the popish powder plot said to see parliament blown upside down i wouldn't miss it for a million sterling what was barclphedro that meanest and most terrible of things an envious man envy is a thing ever easily placed at court courts abound in impertinent people in idlers in rich loungers hungering for gossip in those who seek for needles in trusses of hay in triflers in banterers bantered in witty ninnies who cannot do without converse with an envious man what a refreshing thing is the evil spoken to you of others envy is good stuff to make a spy there is a profound <laughs> analogy between that natural passion envy and that social function espionage the spy hunts on others account like the dog the envious man hunts on his own like the cat a fierce myself such is the envious man he had other qualities barclphedro was discreet secret concrete he kept in everything and racked himself with his hate enormous baseness implies enormous vanity he was liked by those whom he amused and hated by all others but he felt that he was disdained by those who hated him and despised by those who liked him he restrained himself all his gall simmered noiselessly in his hostile resignation he was indignant as if rogues had the right to be so he was the fury's silent prey to swallow everything was his talent there were deaf deaf wraths within him frenzies of interior rage black and brooding flames unseen he was a smoke consuming man of passion the surface was smiling he was kind prompt easy amiable obliging never mind to whom never mind where he bowed for a breath of wind he inclined to the earth what a source of fortune to have a reed for a spine such concealed and venomous beings are not so rare as is believed we live surrounded by ill-omened crawling things wherefore the malevolent a keen question the dreamer constantly proposes it to himself and the thinker never resolves it hence the sad eye of the philosopher is ever fixed upon that mountain of darkness which is destiny and from the top of which the colossal spectre of evil casts handfuls of serpents over the earth barclphedro's body was obese and his face lean a fat bust and a bony countenance his nails were channeled and short his fingers knotted his thumbs flat his hair coarse his temples wide apart and his forehead a little murderer's broad and low the littleness of his eye was hidden under his bushy eyebrows his nose long sharp and flabby nearly met his mouth barclphedro properly attired as an emperor would have somewhat resembled domitian his face of muddy yellow might have been mottled in slimy paste his immovable cheeks were like putty he had all kinds of ugly refractory wrinkles the angle of his jaw was massive his chin heavy his ear underbred his repose and seen in profile his upper lip was raised at an acute angle showing two teeth 
Those teeth seemed to look at you. The teeth can look just as the eye can bite. Patience, temperance, continence, reserve, self-control, anemone, deference, gentleness, politeness, sobriety, chastity, completed and finished Barclphedro. He culminated the, those virtues by their possessions. In a short time, Barclphedro took a foothold at court. End of chapter seven. Okay, cool. So, Barclphedro is a little wiggly worm. So he takes the the appointment as being part of the flotsam um flotsam uh department and so like anything that washes up on sea which he lied to Hosiana and said that it was few and far between like not many things wash up and usually like the messages aren't really like actually pertinent um but that was a lie there's a lot of garbage that washes up and a lot of messages and bottles that wash up. And so he has positioned himself in that he can control the information that goes to court, that goes to the aristocracy. But he knows all because he opens all of them and reads all of them. And he is sort of picking and choosing the information that he's actually sharing, which is pretty devious. And we learn that Barclphedro is not the type of person that wants money for rewards. He just wants to see people suffer, and that makes him happy. And in doing so, he has sort of, you know, put his foot in, to, in the door of being the information person and is wiggling his way right on up to importance. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Chapter 8. In Fairy. There are two ways of making a footing at court. In the clouds, and you are August. In the mud, and you are powerful. In the first case, you belong to Olympus. In the second case, you belong to the private closet. He who belongs to Olympus has but the thunderbolt. He who is of the private closet has the police. The private closet contains all the instruments of government, and sometimes, for it is a traitor, its chastisement. Helio Gabalus Helio Gabalus goes there to die. Then it is called the latrines. Generally, it is less tragic. It is there that Alberoni admires Vendome. Royal personages willingly make it their place of audience. It takes the place of the throne. Louis the Fourteenth receives the Duchess of Burgundy there. Philip the Fifth is shoulder to shoulder there with the Queen. The priest penetrates into it. The private closet is sometimes a branch of the confessional. Therefore, it is that at court there are underground fortunes, not always the least. If, under Louis XI, you would be great, be Pierre de Rohan, Marshal of France. If you would be influential, be Olivier Le Dame, the barber. If you would, under Mary de Medici, be glorious, be Sillery, the Chancellor. If you would be a person of consideration, be Lahanan, the maid. If you would, under Louis the Fifteenth, be illustrious, be Choiseul, the minister. If you would be formidable, be Lebel, the valet. Given Louis the Fourteenth. Bontemps, who makes his bed, is more powerful than Nouveau, who raises his armory, his armies, and Turin, who gains his victories. From Richelieu, take Père jo Joseph, and you have Richelieu nearly empty. There is the mystery, the less, 
His eminence in scarlet is magnificent. His eminence in gray is terrible. What power in being a worm? All the Narvaez amalgamated with all the O'Donnells do less work than one sore Petrosim. Mio. Petrosimio. Petrosimio. Of course the condition of this power is littleness. If you would be if you would remain powerful, remain petty, be nothingness. The serpent in repose, twisted into a circle, is a figure at the same time of the infinite and of naught. One of these viper like fortunes had fallen to Barclfedro. He had crawled where he wanted. Flat beasts can get in everywhere. Louis the Fourteenth had bugs in his bed and Jesuits in his policy. The incompatibility is nil. In this world, everything is a clock. To gravitate is to oscillate. One pole is attracted to the other. Francis I is attracted by Triboulet. Louis the Fourteenth is attracted by Lebel. There exists a deep affinity between extreme elevation and extreme debasement. It is abasement which directs. Nothing is easier of comprehension. It is he who is below who pulls the strings. No position more convenient. He is the eye and has the ear. He is the eye of the government. He has the ear of the king. To have the eye of the king is to draw and shut, at one's whim, the bolt of the royal conscience, and to throw into that conscience whatever one wishes. The mind of the king is his cupboard. If he be a rag-picker, it is his basket. The ears of kings belong not to kings, and therefore it is that, on the whole, the poor devils are not altogether responsible for their actions. He who does not possess his own thought does not possess his own deed. A king obeys. What? An evil spirit buzzing from outside in his ear. A noise a noisome fly of the abyss. This buzzing commands. A rain is a dictation. The loud voice is the sovereign. The low voice, sovereignty. Those who know how to distinguish in a rain this low voice and to hear what it whispers to the loud are the real historians. That's interesting. And I can totally see why Victor Hugo was shunned, why he was um, thrown out of his country. Um, these are very harsh words <laughs> that he's saying and very pointed depictions of politics. Basically saying like, kings don't think for themselves. They don't hear what's actually happening for themselves. They don't make decisions based on those thoughts and their processes to lead correctly. What they hear are the people around them. And the people around them, of course, are not the people who might be leading them with altruistic good. Because you're within your own circle, and everybody has these thoughts and ideas and wants to control the power and, you know, all those all those things that come with power and responsibility and money and all that stuff. But it is interesting, this last bit, the loud voice is sovereign, the low voice, sovereignty. Those who know how to distinguish in a rain, this low voice, and to hear what it whispers to the loud are the real historians, which is really cool. Like, if you're able to distinguish the difference, good on you. You're actually knowing what the history is instead of, like, what is being told the history is. All right. Chapter 9. Hate is as strong as love. Queen Anne had several of these low voices about her. Barclfedro was one. Besides the queen, he secretly worked, influenced, and plotted upon Lady Hosiana and Lord David. 
as we have said, he whispered in three ears. One more than somebody else. Dango? Um, we're going to say that it was Dango. Dango whispered in but two, in the days when, thrusting himself between Louis the Fourteenth in love with Henrietta, his sister-in-law, and Henrietta in love with Louis the Fourteenth, her brother-in-law, he being Louis's secretary, without the knowledge of Henrietta, and Henrietta's without the knowledge of Louis, he wrote the questions and answers of both the lovemaking marionettes. Barclphedro was so cheerful, so accepting, so incapable of taking up the defense of anybody, possessing so little devotion at bottom, so ugly, so mischievous, that it was quite natural that a regal personage should come to be unable to do without him. Once Anne had tasted Barclphedro, she would have no other flatterer. He flattered her as they flatter Louis the Great, by stinging, by stinging her neighbors. There we go. The king, being ignorant, says Madame de Montchevreau, is, one is obliged to mo mock at the savants. To poison the sting from time to time is the acme of art. Nero loves to see Locusta at work. Royal palaces are very easily entered. These madrepores have a way in soon guessed at, contrived, examined, and scooped out at need by the gnawing thing which is called the courtier. A pretext to enter is sufficient. Barclphedro, having found this pretext, his position with the queen soon became the same as that with the Duchess Hosiana, that of an indispensable domestic animal. A witticism risked one day by him immediately led to his perfect understanding of the queen and how to estimate exactly her kindness of heart. The queen was greatly attached to her lord steward, William Cavendish, Duke of Devonshire, who was a great lord. This lord, who had obtained every Oxford degree and did not know how to spell, one fine morning committed the folly of dying. To die is a very imprudent thing at court, for there is then no further restraint in speaking of you. The queen, in the presence of Barclphedro, lamented the event, finally exclaiming with a sigh, It is a pity that so many virtues should have been born and served by so poor an intellect. And then uh, Barclphedro whispered something in French. <laughs> whispered Barclphedro in a low voice and in French. The queen smiled. Barclphedro noted the smile. His conclusion was that biting pleased. Free license had been given to his spite. From that day he thrust his curiosity everywhere and his malignity with it. He was given his way. So much was he feared. He who can make the king laugh makes the others tremble. He was a powerful buffoon. Every day he worked his way forward, underground. Barclphedro became a necessity. Many great people honored him with their confidence, to the extent of charging him, when they required him, with their disgraceful commissions. There are wheels within wheels at court. Barclphedro became the motive power. Have you remarked, in certain mechanisms, the smallness of the motive wheel? Hosiana in particular, who, as we have explained, made use of Barclphedro's talents as a spy, reposed such confidence in him that she had not hesitated to entrust him with one of the master keys of her apartments, by means of which he was able to enter them at any hour. This excessive license of insight into private life was in fashion in the 17th century. It was called giving the key. Hosiana had given two of these confidential keys. Lord David had one, Barclphedro the other. However, to enter straight into a bedchamber was, in the old code of manners, a thing not in the least out of the way. Thence resulted incidents. Lafarte, Laferte, suddenly drawing back the bed, the bed curtains of Mademoiselle Lafont, found inside Sainsome. The Black Musketeer, excuse me. 
Barkilphedro excelled in making the cunning discoveries which place the great in the power of the little. His walk in the dark was winding, soft, clever. Like every perfect spy, he was composed of the inclemency of the executioner and the patience of a micrograph. He was a born courtier. Every courtier is a noctumbalist. The courtier prowls in the night, which is called power. He carries a dark lantern in his hand. He lights up the spot he wishes and remains in darkness himself. What he seeks with his lantern is not a man. It is a fool. What he finds is the king. Kings do not like to see those about them pretend to greatness. Irony aimed at anyone except themselves has a charm for them. The talent of Barkilphedro consisted in a perpetual dwarfing of the peers and princes to the advantage of Her Majesty's stature, thus increased in proportion. The master key held by Barkilphedro was made with two sets of wards, one at each end, so as to open the inner apartments in both Hosiana's favorite residences, Hunkerville House in London, Corleone Lodge at Windsor. These two houses were part of the Clan Charlie inheritance. Hunkerville House was close to Oldgate. Oldgate was a gate of London, which was entered by the Harwich Road, and on which was displayed a statue of Charles II, with a painted angel on his head, and beneath his feet a carved lion and unicorn. From Hunker House, Hunkerville House, in an easterly wind, you heard the peals of St. Marylebone. Corleone Lodge was a Florentine palace of brick and stone, with a marble colonnade built on pilework at Windsor, at the head of the wooden bridge, and having one of the finest courts in England. In the latter palace, near Windsor Castle, Hosiana was within the Queen's reach. Nevertheless, Hosiana liked it. Scarcely anything in appearance... Everything in the root, such was the influence of Barkilphedro over the queen. There is nothing more difficult than to drag up these bad grasses of the court. They take a deep root and offer no hold above the surface. To root out a roquelaire, a triboule, or a brummel is almost impossible. From day to day, and more and more, did the queen take Barkilphedro into her good graces. Sarah Jennings is famous. Barkilphedro is unknown. His existence remains ignorant. The name of Barkilphedro has not reached as far as history. All the moles are not caught by the mole trapper. Barkilphedro, once a candidate for orders, had studied a little of everything. Skimming all things leaves not for result. One may be victim of the omnis res civilis, having the vessel of the Danaids in one hand. In one's head is the misfortune of a whole race of learned men who may be termed the sterile. What Barkilphedro had put into his brain had left it empty. The mind, like nature, abhors vacuum. Into emptiness nature puts love. The mind often puts hate. Hate occupies. Hate for hate's sake exists. Art for art's sake exists in nature more than is believed. A man hates, he must do something. Gratuitous hate, formidable word. It means hate which is itself is own payment. The bear le lives by licking his claws, not indefinitely, of course. The claws must be revictualed. Something must be put under them. Hate indistinct is sweet and suffices, suffices for a time, but one must end by having an object. An animosity diffused over creation is exhausting, like every solitary pleasure. Hate without an object is like a shooting match without a target. What lends interest to the game is a heart to be pierced. One cannot hate solely for honor. Some seasoning is necessary. A man, a woman, somebody to destroy. 
this service of making the game interesting of offering an end of throwing passion into hate by mixing it on an object of of amusing the hunter by the sight of his living prey giving the watcher the hope of the smoking and boiling blood about to flow of amusing the bird catcher by the credulity of the uselessly winged lark of being a victim unknowingly reared for murder by a mastermind all this exquisite and horrible surface of which the person rendering it is unconscious hosiana rendered barkle phaedro thought is a projectile barkle phaedro had from the first day begun to aim at hosiana the evil intentions which were in his mind an intention and a carbine are alike Barclfedro aimed at Hosiana, directing against the Duchess all his secret malice. That astonishes you. What has the bird done at which you fire? You want to eat it, you say. And so it was with Barclfedro. Hosiana could not be struck in the heart. The spot where the enigma lies is hard to wound, but she could be struck in the head, that is, in her pride. It was there that she thought herself strong, and that she was weak. Barclfedro had found it out. If Hosiana had been able to see clearly through the night of Barclfedro, if she had been able to distinguish what lay in ambush behind his smile, that proud woman, so highly situated, would have trembled. Fortunately for the tranquility of her sleep, she was in complete ignorance of what was in the man. The unexpected spreads, one knows not whence. The profound depths of life are dangerous. There is no small hate. Hate is always enormous. It preserves its stature in the smallest being and remains a monster. An elephant hated by a worm is in danger. Even before he struck, Barclfedro felt with joy the foretaste of the evil action which he was about to commit. He did not as yet know what he was going to do to Hosiana, but he had made up his mind to do something. To have come to this decision was a great step taken. To crush Hosiana utterly would have been too great a triumph. He did not hope for so much, but to humiliate her, lessen her, bring her grief, redden her proud eyes with tears of rage. What a success. He counted on it. Tenacious, diligent, faithful to the torment of his neighbor, not to be torn from his purpose, nature had not formed him for nothing. He well understood how to find the flaw in Hosiana's golden armor, and how to make the blood of that Olympian flow. What benefit, we ask again, would accrue to him in doing so? An immense benefit. Doing evil to one who had done good to him. What is an envious man? An ungrateful one. He hates the light which lights and warms him. Zoilus hated that benefit to man, Homer. To inflict on Hosiana what would nowadays be called vivisection, to place her, all convulsed, on his anatomical table, to dissect her alive at his leisure in some surgery, to cut her up as an amateur while she should scream, this dream delighted Barclfedro. To arrive at this result, it was necessary to suffer somewhat himself. He did so willingly. We may pinch ourselves with our own pinchers. The knife, as it shuts, cuts our fingers. What does it matter? That he should partake of Hosiana's torture was a matter of little moment. The executioner handling the red-hot iron when about to brand a prisoner, takes no heed of a little burn. Because another suffers much, he suffers nothing. To see the victim's writhings take all pain from the inflictor. Do harm, whatever happens. To plan evil for others is mingled with an acceptance of some hazy responsibility. We risk ourselves in the danger which we impel towards another. Because the chain of events sometimes, of course, brings unexpected accidents. This does not stop the man who is truly malicious. He feels as much joy as the pa patient 
sufferer's agony. He is tickled by the laceration of the victim. The malicious man blooms in hideous joy. Pain reflects itself on him in a sense of welfare. The Duke of Alva used to warm his hands at the stake. The pile was torture, the reflection of it pleasure. That such transpositions should be possible makes one shudder. Our dark side is unfathomable. Supplice equis, exquisite torture. The expression is in Bowden. Has perhaps this terrible triple sense. Search for the torture, suffering of the tortured, delight of the torturer. And we have a note right after Bowden, and it says... Book 1, page 196. Here we are. Ambition, appetite, all such words signify someone sacrificed to someone satiated. It is sad that hope should be wicked. It is that the outpourings of our wishes flow naturally to the direction to which we must we most incline that of evil. One of the hardest labors of the just man is to expunge from his soul a malevolence which it is difficult to efface. Almost all our desires, when examined, contain what we dare not avow. In the completely wicked man this exists in hideous perfection, so much the worse for others, signifies so much the better for himself. The shadows of the caverns of man's mind. Hosiana, in a plenitude of security, the fruit of ignorant pride, had a contempt for all danger. The feminine faculty of disdain is extraordinary. Hosiana's disdain, unreasoning, involuntary, and confident. Barclphedro was, to her, so contemptible that she would have been astonished had anyone remarked to her that such a creature existed. She went and came and laughed before this man, who was looking at her with evil eyes, thoughtful. He bided this time. In proportion, as he waited, his determination to cast a despair into this woman's life augmented, inexorable high tide of malice. In the meantime, he gave himself excellent reasons for his determination. It must not be thought that scoundrels are deficient in self-esteem. They enter into details with themselves in their lofty monologues, and they take matters with a high hand. How? This Hosiana had bestowed charity on him. She had thrown some crumbs of her enormous wealth to him as to a beggar. She had nailed and riveted him to an office which was unworthy him. Yes, that he, Barclay... Barclphedro, almost a clergyman, a varied and profound talent, a learned man, with a material in him for a bishop, should have for employ the registration of nasty, patience-trying shards, that he should have to pass his life in the garret of a register office, gravely uncorking stupid bottles, encrusted with all the nastiness of the sea, deciphering musty parchments, like filthy conjuring books, dirty wills, and other illegible stuff of the kind, was the fault of this Hosiana. Worst of all, this creature veed and vowed him. He should not revenge himself. He should not punish such conduct. Well, in that case, there would no longer be justice on earth. End of chapter nine. Okay, so, um, Barclphedro is a little extreme. Um, he just super enjoys other people's misery. And he knows that he cannot attack Hosiana by attacking her heart. Like, she doesn't have a heart. There's not really anything there. But he can attack her by attacking her brain and attacking her pride. And that's where he's going to take her down, basically. And then we get, like, this description about, like, how if she was being tortured, like, he would want to be there, 
right there. And it's okay if he gets a little hurt because he wouldn't even feel it because her misery would be so great that he would only find joy. Barkle Phaedro, I think you need to talk to somebody. I feel like you need some therapy. So. Chapter 10. The flame which would be seen if man were transparent. What? This woman, this extravagant thing, this libidinous dreamer, a virgin until the opportunity occurred, this bit of flesh as yet unfreed, this bold creature under a princess's coronet, this Diana by pride as yet untaken by the first comer, just because chance had so willed it, this bastard of a low-lived king who had not the intellect to keep his place, this duchess by a lucky hit who, being a fine lady, played the goddess, and who, had she been poor, would have been a prostitute, this lady, more or less, this robber of a proscribed man's good, this overbearing strumpet, because one day he, Barkle Phaedro, had not money enough to buy his dinner and to get a lodging. She had had the imprudence to seat him in her house at the corner of a table and to put him up in some hole in her intolerable palace. Where? Never mind where. Perhaps in the barn? Perhaps in the cellar? What does it matter? A little better than her valets, a little worse than her heroes. She had abused his distress, his barkle phaedros, in hastening to do him treacherous good, a thing which the rich do in order to humiliate the poor, and to tie them like curs led by a string. Besides, what did the service she render him cost her? A service is worth what it costs. She had spare rooms in her house. She came to Barkle Phaedro's aid, a great thing indeed. Had she eaten a spoonful the less of turtle soup for it? Had she deprived herself of anything in the hateful overflowing of her super superfluous luxuries? No. She had added to it a vanity, a luxury, a good action like a ring on her finger, the relief of a man of wit, of patronization, of clergyman. She could give herself airs, say, I lavish kindness. I fill the mouths of men of letters. I am his benefactress. How lucky the wretch was to find me out. What a patroness of the arts I am. All for having set up a truckle bed in a wretched garret in the roof. As for the place in the admiralty, Barcalfedro owed it to Hosiana. By Jove, a petty appointment. Hosiana had made Barcalfedro what he was. She had created him. Be it so. Yes, created nothing. Less than nothing. For in his absurd situation he felt borne down, tongue-tied, disfigured. What did he owe Hosiana? The thanks due from a hunchback to the mother who bore him deformed. Behold your privileged ones, your folks overwhelmed with fortune, your parvenus, your favorites of that horrid stepmother fortune. And that man of talent, Barcalfedro, was obliged to stand on staircases, to bow to footmen, to climb to the top of the house at night, to be courteous, assiduous, pleasant, respectful, and to have ever on his muscle a respectful grimace. Was not it enough to make him gnash his teeth with rage? And all the while she was putting pearls round her neck, and making amorous poses to her fool, Lord David Deary Moore, the hussy. Never let anyone do you a service. They will abuse the advantage it gives them. Never allow yourself to be taken in the act of inanition. Inanition. There we go. They would relieve you. Because he was starving, this woman had found it a sufficient pretext to give him bread. From that moment he was her servant, a craving of the stomach, and there is a chain for life. To be obliged is to be sold. 
the happy, the powerful, make use of the moment you stretch out your hand to place a penny in it, and at the crisis of your weakness make you a slave, and a slave of the worst kind, the slave of an act of charity, a slave forced to love the enslaver. What infamy, what want of delicacy, what an assault on your self-respect. Then all is over. You are sentenced for life to consider this man good, that woman beautiful, to remain in the back rows, to approve, to applaud, to admire, to worship, to prostrate yourself, to blister your knees by long genuflections, to sugar your words when you are gnawing your lips with anger, when you are biting down your cries of fury, and when you have within you more savage turbulence and more bitter foam than the sea. It is thus that the rich make prisoners of the poor. This slime of a good action performed towards you bedaubs the, and bespatters you with mud forever. An alms is irremediable. Gratitude is paralysis. A benefit is a sticky and repugnant adherence which deprives you of free movement. Those odious, opulent, and spoiled creatures whose pity has thus injured you are well aware of this. It is done. You are their creature. They have bought you. And how? By a bone taken from their dog and cast to you. They have flung that bone at your head. You have been stoned as much as benefited. It is all one. Have you gnawed the bone? Yes or no? You have had your place in the dog kennel as well. Then be thankful. Be ever thankful. Adore your masters. Kneel on indefinitely. A benefit implies an understood inferiority accepted by you. It means that you feel them to be gods and yourself a poor devil. Your, diminu your diminution augments them. Your bent form makes theirs more upright. In the tones of their voices, there is an impertinent inflection. Their family matters, their marriages, their baptisms, their childbearings, their progeny, all concern you. A wolf cub is born to them. Well, you have to compose a sonnet. You are a poet because you are low. Isn't it enough to make the stars fall? A little more and they would make you wear their old shoes. Who have you got there, my dear? How ugly he is. Who is that man? I do not know. A sort of scholar whom I feed. Thus converse these idiots, without even lowering their voice. You hear and remain mechanically amiable. If you are ill, your masters will send for the doctor, not their own. Occasionally, they may even inquire after you being of a different species from you, and at an inaccessible height above you, they are affable. Their height makes them easy. They know that equality is impossible. By force of disdain, they are polite. At table, they give you a little nod. Sometimes they absolutely know how your name is spelt. They only show that they are your protectors by walking unconsciously over all the delicacy and susceptibility you possess. You possess. They treat you with good nature. Is all this to be borne? No doubt he was eager to punish Luciana. He must teach her with whom she had to deal. Oh, my rich gentry, because you cannot eat up everything, because opulence produces indigestion, seeing that your stomachs are no bigger than ours, because it is, after all, better to distribute the remainder than to throw it away. You exalt a morsel flung to the poor into an act of magnificence. Oh, you give us bread. You give us shelter. You give us clothes. You give us employment. And you push audacity, folly, cruelty, stupidity, and absurdity to the pitch of believing that we are grateful. The bread is the bread of servitude, the shelter is a footman's bedroom, the clothes are a livery, the employment is ridiculous, paid for, it is true, but brutalizing. 
oh, you believe in the right to humiliate us with lodging and nourishment, and you imagine that you are your debtors, and you count on your gratitude. Very well. We will eat up your substance. We will devour you alive and gnaw your heartstrings with our teeth. This, Hosiana, was it not absurd? What merit had she? She had accomplished the wonderful work of coming into the world as a testimony of the folly of her father and the shame of her mother. She had done us the favor to exist, and for her kindness in becoming a public scandal they paid her millions. She had estates and castles, warrens, parks, lakes, forests, and I know not what besides, and with all that she was making a fool of herself, and verses were addressed to her. And Barclphedro, who had studied and labored and taken pains, and suffered his eyes and his brain with great books, who had grown moldy in old works and in science, who was full of writ, who could command armies, and who could, if he would, write tragedies like Otwe and Dryden, who was made to be an emperor, Barclphedro had been reduced to permit this nobody to prevent him from dying of hunger. Could the usurpation of the rich, the hateful elect of chance, go further? They put on the semblance of being generous to us, of protecting us and of smiling on us, and we would drink their blood and lick our lips after it. That this low woman of the court should have the odious power of being a benefactress, and that a man so superior should be condemned to pick up such bribes falling from such a hand, what a frightful iniquity. And what social system is this which has for its base disproportion and injustice? Would it not be best to take it by the four corners, and to throw pell-mell to the ceiling, the, dam the damask tablecloth, and the festival, and the orgies, and the tippling, and drunkenness, and the guests, and those with their elbows on the table, and those with their paws under it, and the insolent who give, and the idiots who accept, and to spit it all back again in the face of providence, and fling all the earth to the heavens? In the meantime, let us stick our claws into Hosiana. Thus dreamed Barclphedro. Such were the ragings of his soul. It is the habit of the envious man to absolve himself, amalgamating with his personal grievance the public wrongs. All the wild forms of hateful passions went and came in the intellect of this ferocious being. At the corners of old maps of the world of the fifty of the fifteenth century are great vague spaces without shape or name on which are written these three words hic sunt leones. Such a dark corner is there also a man. Passions grow and growl somewhere within us, and we may say of an obscure portion of our souls, there are lions here. Is this scaffolding of wild reasoning absolutely absurd? Does it lack a certain justice? We must confess it does. It is fearful to think that judgment within us is not justice. Judgment is the relative. Justice is the absolute. Think of the indifference between a judge and a just man. Wicked men lead conscience astray with authority. There are gymnastics of untruth. A sophist is a forger, and this forger sometimes brutalizes good sense. A certain logic, very supple, very implacable, and very agile, is at the service of evil, and excels in stabbing truth in the dark. These blows, these are blows struck by the devil at Providence. The worst of it was that Barclphedro had a presentiment. He was undertaking a heavy task, and he was afraid that after all the evil achievement might not be proportionate to the work. To be corrosive as he was, to have within him a will of steel, a hate of diamond, a burning curiosity for the catastrophe, and to burn nothing, to, to decapitate nothing, to exterminate nothing, to be what he was, a force of devastation, of ferocious animosity, a devourer of the happiness of others, to have been created 
for there is a creator, whether God or devil, and to have been created Barkle Phaedro all over, and to inflict perhaps after all but a fillip of the finger, could this be possible? Could it be that Barkle Phaedro should miss his aim? To be a lever powerful enough to heave great masses of rock, and when sprung to the utmost power to succeed only in giving an affected woman a bump in the forehead, to be a catapult dealing ruin to a pole kitten, to accomplish the task of Sisyphus, to crush an ant, to sweat all over with hate, and for nothing at all. Would this be hum would not this be humiliating? when he felt himself a mechanism of hostility, capable of reducing the world to powder. To put into movement all the wheels within wheels, to work in the darkness all the mechanism of a Marley machine, and to succeed perhaps in pinching the end of a little rosy finger. He was to turn over and over blocks of marble, perchance with the result of ruffling a little the smooth surface of the court. Providence has a way of thus expending forces grandly. The movement of a mountain often only displaces a molehill. Besides this, when the court is the dangerous arena, nothing is more dangerous than to aim at your enemy and miss him. In the first place, it unmasks you and irritates him. But besides and above all, it displeases the master. Kings do not like the unskillful. Let us have no contusions, no ugly gnashes. Kill everybody, but give no one a bloody nose. He who kills is clever. He who wounds, awkward. Kings do not like to see their servants lamed. They are displeased if you chip a porcelain jar on their chimney piece or a courtier in their cortege. The court must be kept neat. Break and replace. That does not matter. Besides, all this agrees perfectly with the taste of princes for scandal. Speak evil, do none, or if you do, let it be in grand style. Stab, do not scratch, unless the pin be poisoned. This would be an extenuating circumstance, and was, we may remember, the case with Barkalphedro. Every malicious pygmy is a vial in which in, is enclosed the dragon of Solomon. The vial is microscopic, the dragon immense. A formidable condensation awaiting the gigantic hour of dilation. Ennui consoled by the premeditation of explosion. The prisoner is larger than the prison. A latent giant. How wonderful. A minnow in which is contained a hydra. To be this fearful, magical box, to contain within him a leviathan, is to dwarf both a torture and a delight. Nor would anything have caused Barkalphedro to let go his hold. He awaited his time. Was it to come? What mattered that? He waited for it. Self-love is mixed up in with the malice of the very wicked man. To make holes and gaps in a court fortune higher than your own, to undermine it at all risks and perils, while encased and concealed yourself, is, we repeat, exceedingly interesting. The player at such a game becomes eager, even to passion. He throws himself into the work as if he were composing an epic. To be very mean and to attack that which is great is in itself a brilliant action. It is a fine thing to be a flea on a lion. The noble beast feels the bite and expends his mighty anger against the atom. An encounter with a tiger would weary him less. See how the actors exchange their parts. The lion, humiliated, feels the sting of the insect, and the flea can say, I have in my veins the blood of a lion. However, these reflections but half appease the cravings of Barkalphedro's pride, consolations, palliations at most. To vex is one thing, to torment would be infinitely better. Barkalphedro had a thought which returned to him without ceasing. His success might not go beyond just irritating the epidermis of Hosiana. What could he hope for more? 
be so obscure against her, so radiant. A scratch is worth but little to him, who longs to see the crimson blood of his flayed victim, and to hear her cries as she lies before him more than naked, without even that garment, the skin. With such a craving, how sad to be powerless. Alas, there is nothing perfect. However, he resigned himself. Not being able to do better, he only dreamed half his dream. To play a treacherous trick is an object, after all. What a man is he who revenges himself for a benefit received. Barclay was a giant among such men. Usually, ingratitude is forgetfulness. With this man, patented in wickedness, it was fury. The vulgar ingrate is full of ashes. What was within Barclay a furnace. Furnace walled round by hate, silence, and rancor, awaiting Hosiana for fuel. Never had a man abhorred a woman to such a point without reason. How terrible. She was his dream, his preoccupation, his ennui, his rage. Perhaps he was a little in love with her. End of chapter 10. Barkle Phaedro. All right. <laughs> so he doesn't just want to hurt Hosiana. He wants to see her struggle and to see her in pain and tortured and all of these other things. And there's a moment where Barkle Phaedro is like, what if what I'm doing doesn't actually hit? What if all of this work that I'm doing doesn't have the impact that I'm looking for? And before that, we get the um, the anger, the rage that Barkle Phaedro has for Hosiana, but more generally for the aristocracy. And he is just able to put all of that rage on Hosiana because he is very smart. He's a lettered man. He has all of these degrees. He's able to read all of these something, something, somethings, and she doesn't. She didn't earn anything in her life, and she is able to just do whatever she wants and get away with whatever, whatever she wants, and all of the aristocracy is like that, and giving out charity makes the lesser beholden to the higher. In that now, it's like, oh, this person is wonderful. This person is so smart. This person is beautiful. This person helped me so greatly when I was down. And therein lies this, like, this conflict, this, uh, this need, this attachment, this forced attachment between the aristocracy and the poor. And so... Barkle Phaedro is pissed, <laughs> real upset, and will be taking everything out on Hosiana. I am intrigued. I am intrigued, and I'm interested. I am both of those things at the same time. Chapter 11. <laughs> Barkle Phaedro in ambuscade. To find the vulnerable spot in Hosiana and to strike her there was, for all the causes he have, we have just mentioned, the imperturbable determination of Barkle Phaedro. The wish is sufficient. The power is required. How was he to set about it? There was the question. Vulgar vagabonds set the scene of any wickedness they intend to commit with care. They do not feel themselves strong enough to seize the opportunity as it passes, to take possession of it by fair means or foul, and to constrain it to serve them. Deep scoundrels disdain preliminary combinations. They start from their villainies alone, merely arming themselves all around, prepared to avail themselves of various chances which may occur, and then, like Barclay Phaedro, await 
the opportunity. They know that a ready-made scheme runs the risk of fitting ill into the event which may present itself. It is not thus that a man makes himself master of possibilities and guides them as one pleases. You can come to no previous arrangement with destiny. Tomorrow will not obey you. There is a certain want of discipline in chance. Therefore they watch for it and summon it suddenly, authoritatively, on the spot. No plan, no sketch, no rough model, no ready-made shoe ill-fitting the unexpected. They plunge headlong into the dark to turn to immediate and rapid profit any circumstance that can aid him is the quality which distinguishes the able scoundrel and elevates the villain into the demon to strike suddenly at fortune that is true genius the true scoundrel strikes you from a sling with the first stone he can pick up clever malefactors count on the unexpected that senseless accomplice of so many crimes they grasp the incident and leap on it. There is no better ars poetica for this species of talent. Meanwhile, be sure with whom you have to deal. Survey the ground. While Barcalfedro, with Barcalfedro, the ground was Queen Anne. Barcalfedro approached the queen and so close that sometimes he fancied he heard the monologues of her majesty. Sometimes he was present, unheeded at conversations between the sisters. Neither did they forbid his, si his sliding in a word. He profited by this to lessen himself, a way of inspiring confidence. Thus one day in the garden at Hampton Court, being behind the duchess who was behind the queen, he heard Anne, following the fashion, awkwardly enunciating sentiments. Animals are happy said the queen. They run no risk of going to hell. They are there already, replied Hosiana. This answer, which bluntly substituted philosophy or religion, displeased the queen. If, perchance, there was depth in the observation, Anne felt shocked. My dear, said she to Hosiana, we talk hell, we talk of hell like a couple of fools, Ask Barcalfedro all about it. He ought to know such things. As a devil? asked Hosiana. As a beast, replied Barcalfedro with a bow. Madam, said the queen to Hosiana, he is cleverer than we. For a man like Barcalfedro to approach the queen was to obtain a hold on her. He could say, I hold her. Now he wanted a means of taking advantage of his power for his own benefit. He had his foothold in the court. To be settled there was a fine thing. No chance could now escape him. More than once he had made the queen smile maliciously. This was having a license to shoot. But was there any preserved game? Did this license to shoot permit him to break the wing or the leg of one like the sister of Her Majesty? The first point to make clear was, did the queen love her sister? One false step would lose all. Barcalfedro watched. Before he, plays the, before he plays the player, looks at the cards. What trumps has he? Barcalfedro began by examining the age of the two women, Hosiana, 23, Anne, 41. So far, so good. He held trumps. The moment that a woman ceases to count by springs and begins to count by winters, she becomes cross. A dull rancor possesses her against the time of which she carries the proofs. Fresh-blown beauties, perfumes of others, are to such a one but thorns. Of the roses she feels but the prick. It seems as if all the freshness is stolen from her, and that beauty decreases in her because it increases in others. To profit by this secret ill-humour, to dive into the wrinkle on the face of this woman of forty, who was a queen, seemed a good game for Bar Barcalfedro. Envy excels in exciting jealousy, as a rat draws the crocodile from its hole. Barcalfedro fixed his wise gaze on Anne. He saw into the queen as one sees into a stagnant pool. 
The marsh has its transparency. In dirty water, we see vices. In muddier water, we see stupidity. Anne was muddy water. Embryos of sentiments and larvae of ideas moved in her thick brain. They were not distinct. They were scarcely any outline, but they were realities, however shapeless. The queen thought this. The queen desired that. To decide what was the difficulty, the confused transformations which work in stagnant water are difficult to study. The queen, habitually obscure, sometimes made sudden and stupid revelations. It was on these that it was necessary to seize. You must take advantage of them on the moment. How did the queen feel towards the Duchess Hosiana? Did she wish her evil or good? Here was the problem. Barclay set himself to solve it. This problem solved, he might go further. Divers' chances served Barclay his tenacity at the watch above all. Anne was, on her husband's side, slightly related to the new queen of Prussia, wife of the king with the hundred chamberlains. She had her portrait painted on enamel after the process of Turquay of Mayern. This queen of Prussia had also a younger illegitimate sister, the Baroness of Dreika. One day, in the presence of Barclay, Anne asked the Russian ambassador some question about this Dreika. They say she is rich. Very rich. She has palaces, more magnificent than those of her sister, the queen. Whom will she marry? A great lord, the Count Gormo. Pretty? Charming. Is she young? Very young. As beautiful as the queen? The ambassador lowered his voice and replied, More beautiful. That is insolent, murmured Barclay. The queen was silent, then she exclaimed, Those bastards! Barclay noticed the plural. Another time, when the queen was leaving the chapel, Barclay kept pretty close to her majesty, behind the two grooms of the almonry. Lord David Deary Moore, crossing the ranks of the women, made a sensation by his handsome appearance. As he passed, there was an explosion of feminine exclamations. How elegant! How gallant! What a noble air! How handsome! How disagreeable, grumbled the queen. Barclay overheard this. It decided him. He could hurt the Duchess without displeasing the Queen. The first problem was solved, but now the second presented itself. What could he do to harm the Duchess? What means did his wretched appointment offer to attain so difficult an object? Evidently, none. End of chapter 11. Okay, so, Barclay is trying to discredit and hurt Hosiana. And he is, has gotten closer to Queen Anne, and he doesn't quite know if he can say bad things about this duchess. So he's sort of like testing the waters and waiting and just very closely listening to the interactions that um, she's having where something comes up <laughs> around um Hosiana. And one of them, um, the Queen Queen Anne said something, made a comment, and Hosiana like changed the subject away from philosophy to religion, and Queen Anne did not really like that. And um Barclay took note of that. And there was a moment when sort of the same situation is happening in another country or in another part. And uh Barclay is like paying attention to that and the questions that the queen is asking and like the um the duchess is younger than you know this other queen and the duchess is prettier than this other queen and the duchess has nicer palaces than this other queen and the queen doesn't like that and has an outburst of it and there is a plural which Barclay takes note of and is going to translate that to also being Hosiana and then there's a moment when Lord David, who Hosiana is supposed to be marrying, is walking along and all of the women are swooning and Queen Anne is just like, it was despicable. 
and Sparkle Sojo takes note of that and now knows that he can talk badly about Hosiana to the queen without the queen being offended. So now he has this new problem, which is what can he do to actually hurt Hosiana? So he's trying to figure that part out now. Oh man, I have made a mess. Okay. Chapter 12. Scotland, Ireland, and England. Let us note a circumstance. Hosiana had le tour. This is easy to understand when we reflect that she was, although illegitimate, the queen's sister, that is to say, a princely personage. To have le tour, what does it mean? Viscount St. John, otherwise Bolingbroke, wrote as follows to Thomas Leonard, Earl of Sussex. Two things mark the great. In England, they have le tour. In France, le tour. When the king... Is this... Is he still writing? No, he's not. Okay. <laughs> when the king of France traveled, the courier of the court stopped at the halting place in the evening and assigned lodgings to his majesty's suite. Amongst the gentlemen, some had an immense privilege. They have le pur, says the journal historique for the year 1694, page 6, which means that the courier who marks the, the billets puts poor before their names as poor monsieur le prince de Soubise, instead of which, when he marks the lodging of one who is not royal, he does not put poor, but simply the name as le duc de Jevis, le duc de Mazarin. This poor, an adore indicated a prince or a favorite. A favorite is worse than a prince. The king granted le poor, like a blue ribbon or a peerage. Avoir le tour in England was less glorious, but more real. It was a sign of intimate communication with the sovereign. Whoever might be, by birth or favor, in a position to receive direct communication from majesty, had in the wall of their bedchamber a shaft in which was adjusted a bell. The bell sounded, the shaft opened, a royal missive appeared on a gold plate or on a cushion of velvet, and the shaft closed. This intimate and solemn, the mysterious in the familiar, the shaft was used for no other purpose. The sound of the bell announced a royal message. No one saw who brought it. It was, of course, merely the page of the king or the queen. Leicester, avait le tour under Elizabeth. Buckingham under James I, Hosiana had it under Anne, though not much in favor. Never was a privilege more envied. This privilege entailed additional servility. The recipient was more of a servant. At court, that which elevates degrades. Avoir le tour was said in French. This circumstance of English etiquette having, probably, been borrowed from some old French folly. Little allergy. Apology. <laughs> Lady Hosiana, a virgin peerless as Elizabeth had been a virgin queen, led sometimes in the city and sometimes in the country, according to the season, in almost princely life, and kept nearly at court, at which Lord David was courtier, with many others. Not being married, Lord David and Lady Hosiana could show themselves together in public without exciting ridicule, and they did so frequently. They often went to plays and race courses in the same carriage and sat together in the same box. They were chilled by the impending marriage, which was not only permitted to them, but imposed upon them, but they felt an attraction for each other's society. The privacy permitted to the engaged as a frontier easily passed. From this they abstained. That which is easy is in bad taste. The best pugilis pugilistic encounters then took place at Lambeth, a parish in which the Lord Archbishop of Canterbury has a palace, though the air is unhealthy. 
and a rich library open at certain hours to decent people. One evening in winter there was in a meadow there, the gates of which were locked, a fight at which Hosiana, escorted by Lord David, was present. She had asked, Are women admitted? And David had responded, Um, <laughs> son femme magnates? Liberal translation, not shopkeepers. Literal translation, great ladies exist. A duchess goes everywhere. This is why Lady Hosiana saw a boxing match. Lady Hosiana made only this concession, this concession to propriety. She dressed as a man, a very common custom at that period. Women seldom traveled otherwise. Out of every six persons who traveled by the coach from Windsor, it was rare that there were not one or two amongst them who were women in male attire, a certain sign of high birth. Lord David, being in company with a woman, could not take any part in the match himself, and merely assisted as one of the audience. Lady Hosiana betrayed her quality in one way. She had an opera glass, and used by a gentleman only. This encounter in the noble science was presided over by Lord Germain, great-grandfather or great-uncle of that Lord Germain who, towards the end of the eighteenth century, was colonel, ran away in a battle, was afterwards made minister of war, and only escaped from the bolts of the enemy to fall by a worse fate, shot through and through by the sarcasm of Sheridan. Many gentlemen were betting. Harry, below, Bilieu, of Carleton, who had claims to the extinct peerage of Bella Aqua, with Henry, Lord Hyde, member of Parliament for the borough of Dunhevid, which is also Logiston, the Honourable Peregrine Birdie, member of the borough of Truro, with Sir Thomas Culpepper, member for Maidstone, and Laird of Lamirebar which is on the borders of Lothian, with Samuel Trifusis, on the borough of Penryn, Sir Bartholomew Gracedew, of the borough of St. Ives, with the Honorable Charles Bodeville, who was called Robert, who was called Lord Robertus, and who was Custos Rotolorum of the county of Cornwall, besides many others. Did we catch all of that? Of the two combatants, one was an Irishman named after his native mountain in Tipperary, Phelim Madon, and the other a Scot named Helmsgale. They represented the national pride of each country. Ireland and Scotland were about to set to. Aaron was going fisticuffs, gajolth, gajothel, so that the bets amounted to over 40,000 guineas besides the stakes. The two champions were naked, excepting short breeches buckled over the hips and spiked boots laced as high as the ankles. Helmsgale, the Scot, was a youth scarcely nineteen, but he had already had his forehead sewn up, for which reason they laid two and a third to one on him. Two, yeah. The month before, he had broken the ribs and gouged out the eyes of a pugilist named six miles water this explained the enthusiasm he created he had won his backers twelve thousand pounds besides having his forehead sewn up helmsgale's jaw had been broken he was neatly made and active he was about the height of a small woman upright thick-set and of a stature low and threatening and nothing had been lost of the advantages given him by nature not a muscle which was not trained to its object pugilism. His firm chest was compact and brown and shining like brass. He smiled, and three teeth which he had lost added to his smile. His adversary was tall and overgrown, that is to say, weak. He was a man of forty years of age, six feet high, with the chest of a hippopotamus and a mild expression of face. The blow of his fist would break in the deck of a vessel, but he did not know how to use it. The Irishman was all surface, and seemed to have entered the ring to receive rather than to give blows. Only it was felt that he would take a deal of punishment. Like underdone beef, tough to chew, and impossible to swallow. He was what was termed, in local slang, raw meat. 
He squinted. He seemed resigned. The two men had passed the preceding night in the same bed and had slept together. They had each drunk port wine from the same glass to the three-inch mark. Each had his group of seconds, men of savage expression, threatening the umpires when it suited their side. Amongst Hemgale, Helms Gale's supporters was to be seen John Gromain, celebrated for having carried an ox on his back, and one called John Bray, who had once carried on his back ten bushels of flour at fifteen pecks to the bushel, besides the miller himself, and had walked over two hundred paces under the weight. On the side of the Irishman, Lord Hyde had brought from Launchester, Launcheston a certain kilter who lived at Greencastle and could throw a stone weighing twenty pounds to a greater height than the highest tower of the castle. These three men, Kilter, Bray, and Gromain, were Cornishmen by birth and did honor to their country. The other seconds were brutal fellows, with broad backs, bowed legs, knotted fists, dull faces, ragged bearing, ragged, fearing nothing, nearly all jailbirds. Many of them understood admirably how to make the police drunk. Each profession should have its peculiar talents. The field chosen was farther off than the beer garden, where they formally bade. Oh, okay. That wasn't a typo. I read it as beer garden, but it's bear garden, and then I was like, that must be a typo. It's not. So let's go back. <laughs> the field chosen was farther off than the bear garden, where they formerly baited bears, bulls, and dogs. It was beyond the line of the farthest houses, by the side of the ruins of the priory of St. Mary Overy, dismantled by Henry the Eighth. The wind was northerly and biting. A small rain fell, which was instantly frozen into ice. Some gentlemen present were evidently fathers of families, recognized as such by their putting up their umbrellas. On the side of the Irishman was Colonel Moncrief as umpire and Kilter as second to support him on his knee. On the side of Helmsgale, the Honorable Pew... Beaumaris was umpire and Lord Desertum from Kilcurry as bottle holder to support him on his knee. The two combatants stood for a few seconds motionless in the ring whilst the watchers whilst the watches were being compared. They then approached each other and shook hands. Bellum Madone said to Helmsgale, I should prefer going home. Helmsgale answered handsomely. The gentleman no must not be disappointed, on any account. Naked as they were, they felt the cold. Felimadone shook. His teeth chattered. Dr. Eleanor Sharp, nephew of the Archbishop of York, cried out to them, Set to, boys. It will warm you. Those friendly words thawed them. They set to. But neither one nor the other was angry. There were three ineffectual rounds. The Reverend Dr. Grumbraith, one of the forty fellows of All Souls College called, Spirit them up with gin! But the two umpires and the two seconds adhered to the rule, yet it was exceedingly cold. First blood was claimed. They were again set face to face. They looked at each other, approached, stretched their arms, touched each other's fists, and then drew back. All at once Helmsgale, the little man, sprang forward. The real fight had begun. Felimadone was struck in the face between the rays. His whole face streamed with blood. The crowd cried, Helmsgale has tapped his claret. There was applause. Felimadone turned his arms like the sails of a windmill, struck out at random. The honorable peregrine, Bertie said, blinded. But he was not blind yet. Then Helmsgale heard on all sides these encouraging words, Bung up his peepers! On the whole, the two champions were really well matched, and notwithstanding the unfavorable weather, it was seen that the fight would be a success. The great giant Fella Madone had to bear the inconveniences of his advantages. He moved heavily. His arms were massive as clubs, but his chest was a mass. His little opponent ran, struck, sprang, gnashed his teeth, redoubling vigor by quickness. 
from knowledge of the science. On the one side was the primitive blow of the fist, savage, uncultivated, in a state of ignorance, and on the other the civilized blow of the fist. Helmsgale fought as much with his nerves as with his muscles, and with as much intention as force. Felimadone was a kind of sluggish mauler, somewhat mauled himself to begin with. It was art against nature. It was cultivated ferocity against barbarism. It was clear that the barbarism would be beaten, but not very quickly. Hence the interest. A little man against a big one, and the chances are in favor of the little one. The cat has the best of it with a dog. Goliaths are always vanquished by Davids. A hail of exclamations followed the combatants. Bravo, Helmsdale. Helms Gale. Good. Well done, Highlander. Now, Fellum. And the friends of Helms Gale repeated their benevolent extortions. Bung up his peepers. Helms Gale did better. Rapidly bending down and back again with the undulation of a serpent, he struck Fellum Madone in the sternum. The colossus staggered. Foul blow, cried Viscount Barnard. Fellum Madone sank down on the knee of his second, saying, I'm beginning to get warm. Lord Deserton consulted the umpires and said, Five minutes before time is called. Fellow Madone was becoming weaker. Kilter wiped the blood from his face and the sweat from his body with a flannel and placed the neck of a bottle to his mouth. They had come to the eleventh round. Fellum, beside the scar on his forehead, had his breast disfigured by blows, his belly swollen, and the forepart of the head Scar scarified. Helmsgale was untouched. A kind of tumult arose against the gentleman. Lord Bernard repeated, Foul blow! That's void, said the laird of Lamingar. I claim my stake, replied Sir Thomas Culpepper, and the honorable member for the borough of St. Ives, Sir Bol Bartholomew, added, Give me back my five hundred guineas, and I will go. Stop the fight. Fellum arose, staggering like a drunken man, and said, Let us go on fighting, on one condition, that I shall have the right to give one foul blow. They cried, Agreed, from all parts of the ring. Helmsgale shrugged his shoulders. Five minutes elapsed, and they set to again. The fighting, which was agony to Fellum, was play to Helmsgale. Such are the triumphs of science. The little man found means of putting the big one into chancery. That is to say, Helmsgale suddenly took under his left arm, which was bent like a steel crescent, the huge head of Fellum Madone, and held it there under his armpit, the neck bent and twisted, whilst Helmsgale's right fist fell again and again like a hammer on a nail, only from below and striking upward, thus smashing his opponent's face at his ease. When Fellum, released at length, lifted his head, he had no longer a face. That which had been a nose, eyes, and a mouth now looked only like a black sponge, soaked in blood. He spat, and on the ground lay four of his teeth. Then he fell. Kilter received him on his knee. Helmsgale was heartily touched. He had some insignificant bruises and a scratch on his collarbone. No one was cold now. They laid sixteen and a quarter to one on Helmsgale. Harry Carlton cried out, It is all over with Fellum. I will lay my peerage of Bella Aqua and my title of Lord Bellew against the Archbishop of Canterbury's old wig on Helmsgale. Give me your muzzle, said Kilter to Fellum, and stuffing the bloody flannel into the bottle, he washed him all over with gin. The mouth reappeared, and he opened one eyelid, his temples seemed fractured. One more round, my friend, said Kilter, and he added, for the honor of the low town. The Welsh and the Irish understood each other. Still, Fellum made no sign of having any power of understanding left. Fellum arose, supported by Kelter, by Kilter. It was the twenty-fifth round. From the way in which the Cyclops, for he had but one eye, placed himself in position, it was evident that this was the last round, for no one doubted his defeat. He placed his guard below his chin with the awkwardness of a failing man. 
Helmsgale, with a skin hardly sweating, cried out, I'll back myself a thousand to one. Helmsgale, raising his arms, struck out, and, what was strange, both fell. A ghastly chuckle was heard. It was Felum. It was Felum's expression of delight. While receiving the terrible blow given him by Helmsgale on the skull, he had given him a foul blow on the navel. Helmsgale, lying on his back, rattled in his throat. The spectators looked at him as he fell back on the ground and said, Paid back! All clapped their hands, even those who had lost. Felum had given foul blow for foul blow, and had only asserted his right. They carried Helmsgale off on a hand barrow. The opinion was that he would not recover. Lord Robartes exclaimed, I win twelve hundred guineas. Felum was evidently maimed for life. As she left, Hosiana took the arm of Lord David, an act which was tolerated amongst people engaged. She said to him, It is very fine, but... But what? I thought it would have driven away my spleen. It has not. Lord David stopped, looked at Hosiana, shut his mouth, and inflated his cheeks whilst he nodded his head, which signified attention, and said to the Duchess, For spleen there is but one remedy. What is that? Gwynplaine. The Duchess said. And who is Gwynplaine? What a perfect place to end, because that is also the end of the first book. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so in this last chapter, Hosiana and um, Lord David go to a boxing match. And it's these two people who live together. They have no animosity towards each other. They're probably just doing this for money. Um, and they fight for the rich to bet on them and make money from them. And apparently there's something wrong with Hosiana's spleen, and now we're going to be introduced to Gwynplaine, who I'm pretty sure is our main character. I'm still enjoying this. I'm really enjoying Victor Hugo's writing. Um, it's so beautiful and morbid and so striking, um, like very pointed. And yeah, I'm just super enjoying it. I do sometimes every once in a while just get lost in the history. Um, and I know it's all context for like what has come. Like we've already had context for Hosiana and for Lord David and it has come into play when we were talking with Barco Phaedro so just super interesting yeah 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 so yeah that's where we're gonna end today we will pick up next week I know next week right where we left off um I hope you all have a great rest of your night as always whether you lurk whether you chat I 1000% appreciate you and I won thousand percent appreciate your support thank you all so so much for being here <laughs> if i do not see you next time i hope to see you very soon Bye bye